Welcome. I'm Carol Jenkins, Executive Director of Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated. The CF Discovery Series was developed in collaboration with Camille Wasowicz, nurse practitioner at the Stanford CF Adult Clinic. This series is designed to make vital CF information accessible to the CF community. And before beginning, I'd like to note that no information presented tonight is intended for a patient's diagnosis or treatment. As always, we urge you all to work together with your healthcare team for your medical treatment. And tonight we're looking forward to our presentation on managing diabetes in cystic fibrosis. Special thanks to Genentech and to AMED Healthcare for supporting this important evening. Their support pays for the venue and the refreshments, this studio that we've constructed here at the Crown Plaza in Palo Alto, and they pay for other costs associated with this program. Tonight's program is being filmed by Scott Wakefield. Volunteer Eric Martin is handling the streaming portion of this production, and staff member Joanne Davis is tracking questions from our online participants. We are live here at the Crown Plaza in Palo Alto, and I encourage you all to ask questions, whether you're here in the audience or part of our online community. A special shout out to all of you who are in the hospital. We're so glad that you can join us. And finally, thanks to our volunteers, to both Jennifer and Sam tonight, for serving the food and helping us with our cross-infection guidelines. Tonight, our speaker is from Stanford Medical Center. Dr. Tracy McLaughlin is the Assistant Professor of Medicine and Endocrinology. She received her medical degree at UC San Francisco, a master's degree in epidemiology from Stanford University, a master's degree in public health from UC Berkeley, and her bachelor's degree from Stanford University in human biology. Dr. McLaughlin is currently an Assistant Professor at Stanford University's Department of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism. In addition to working with patients, Dr. McLaughlin conducts a number of clinical research studies related to obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Tonight, Dr. McLaughlin is here to talk about managing diabetes in cystic fibrosis. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Carol. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be able to talk to uh, families and caregivers and patients um, about cystic fibrosis-related diabetes. Um, I have a clinic that specializes in this, and I work closely with the Adult CF and Transplant Group at Stanford and have been, for the past uh, decade or longer, um, taking care of a lot of these patients. Uh, so... Um, we will go through the following topics um, in the next 40 minutes or so. We'll talk about the etiology um, or the cause of CF-related diabetes, uh, which is different from other kinds of diabetes. Uh, we'll talk about the clinical significance and why it's important to control the blood sugars in CF-related diabetes, also different from other kinds of diabetes. Uh, we will talk about the prevalence of glucose abnormalities in patients with CF. Um, and then we'll go through some of the new guidelines for screening and diagnosis of CF-related diabetes. And finally, we'll talk about treatment. So just an overview to put things into perspective. Uh, CF, as most of you probably know, is the most common autosomal recessive disease in Caucasians. Non-Caucasians can also be affected. Uh, mutation in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptor gene, uh, which is a chloride channel expressed on epithelial cells, which are the cells that line many of the ducts and linings of, um, you know, the gastrointestinal tract, for example, uh, lead to production of very thick secretions with progressive obstruction and fibrosis of many organs, uh, not only the lungs. We will be focusing on the pancreas, which you can see here uh, is an organ behind the stomach, uh, which has uh, several functions. The exocrine function is the function for digestion. Uh, you can see here um, these little uh, clear uh, circular things are the uh, ducts that secrete the digestive enzymes that are necessary to, to digest the food. Uh, these become disturbed in CF and most of the patients eventually will end up on enzyme replacement. Um, the other part of the pancreas, uh, not so well appreciated, is the endocrine part. 
The endocrine part refers to these cells, these uh, purple cells here called the beta cells, which secrete insulin in response to glucose elevation. Um, and what happens in CF is that um, in the ducts, uh, in the lining of the ducts, there become uh, re retained secretions, which lead to uh, structural abnormalities. Um, so they become distorted and expanded, and they start to extend to the adjacent endocrine cells, uh, leading to impaired secretion of hormones such as insulin. So it's actually a structural disease, starting with the exocrine pancreas that leads to diabetes and CF. This is a completely unique cause of diabetes. Uh, there's nothing like it. Even removal of part of the pancreas, which can cause diabetes, is different in the way that diabetes presents. Uh, autopsy studies of the endocrine pancreas in patients with CF show fatty infiltration, fibrosis, distortion of the islets, which are the insulin-secreting beta cells, and a decreased absolute number of beta cells. Here's a picture of the pancreas. Uh, these pinkish things are retained secretions inside the ducts. Um, there shouldn't be quite this much retained mucus inside the duct. These are the islets. And this is a relatively normal appearance, uh, with at least of the islets. Um, as the disease progresses, the islets can become distorted. Here's a very um, expanded um, uh, secretion within the duct, and the islets are starting to become distorted here. And eventually, there's fatty infiltration and scarring as well. So what happens is the beta cells can't make that first little burst of insulin, which we call um, the first phase insulin response. So when we eat, we make a very quick burst of insulin. Um, and this doesn't happen normally um, in patients with cystic fibrosis. Even in the absence of diabetes, that first phase insulin response is lower uh, than in non-diabetic patients. Um, there also is a delayed insulin response to oral glucose. So um, one study showed a 60-minute delay in the peak insulin in patients who had cystic fibrosis-related impaired glucose tolerance, um, and a 90-minute delay in patients who were um, uh, met criteria for diabetes. These patients are not completely insulin deficient. So if you look at a patient with CF diabetes, they look like what we used to call juvenile onset diabetes or type 1 diabetes, you know, a, a young, thin adult who has diabetes. Those patients, by the time they get diagnosed, they don't make any insulin. And they can have very severe consequences, one of which is called diabetic ketoacidosis. And when that happens, their body is overwhelmed by other substrates made by the liver, namely acids, that can provide energy for the brain. And they are in the hospital, and they're very sick, and they can actually die. This is extremely uncommon in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, we have had one patient who had this twice, and I think that is a case report. It's not published, but it, it basically doesn't happen. And we had tested that patient for autoimmune diabetes. Um, so it's very rare. And the reason is that they make enough insulin to get by. Um, there are other differences um, compared to other diabetes, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but it's also different from type 2 diabetes. So. So may, maybe these patients, your patient with CF might have a mother with type 2 diabetes. And that's a completely different kind of diabetes as well, which is related to making insulin that doesn't work normally. And they become very um, hyperinsulinemic, but the insulin is being hypersecreted to overcome the blockage in effective insulin action. And they're treated very differently. They're, they respond to weight loss and dietary changes. And one thing that happens with a lot of CF patients is they get admitted to the hospital, and the medicine team starts to treat them like one of these other kinds of diabetics. Um, and they especially don't like it when they get put, placed on a diabetic diet. So, so it's important for everyone, especially the, the, the doctors, um, to understand the differences. And unfortunately, um, it's just not that well appreciated how different the kinds of diabetes are. But I wanted to show you this nice figure of the abnormalities in the insulin secretion. So you can see here, these are 34 patients uh, with cystic fibrosis compared to some controls who did not have cystic fibrosis. 
and they were given a um, glucose tolerance test. So they were given a glucose drink, and here you can see what the controls did. Their glucose did not go very high and came down here. Here's what their insulin did. This is a normal response. The insulin goes up right after exposure to the glucose, and then it slowly comes back down. That's a normal response. Now these are all the cystic fibrosis patients. So these are the ones who were normal glucose tolerant. So they weren't anywhere close to diabetes yet, represented by the squares. That's their glucose. It's still abnormal. It goes up right after they eat. Um, and their insulin is actually, here are the squares. It's actually, de it's delayed. You can see that there's, here's normal. Here's a CF without diabetes. There's a delay in insulin secretion. And then as, as you get on to cystic fibrosis-related diabetes, as shown by the um, squares that are open, here's the glucose going way up to 250 and then coming back down. Now, for someone with a different kind of diabetes, to get up to 250 after a glucose challenge or after a meal would be unusual if the fasting glucose was normal. There's a correlation between how high your sugar gets after you eat and how high it is when you wake up. So the fasting glucose correlates with the post-meal excursions. In CF, you can actually see that this patient's starting out normal, and they're getting up into these very high glucose ranges, um, which is characteristic and typical for CF diabetes and different from other kinds of diabetes. And here's the insulin. Again, we're looking at the open squares. Look how little insulin is being made. So the first phase, you know, the early insulin secretion um, is absent, and it's also a delayed um, response. Here is another picture, another study, kind of showing the same thing. Um, but I like to show this because I feel like if people understand the physiology, they can treat the disease better and understand it better. So here's a glucose. Here's a control. Here is a cystic fibrosis patient who does not have diabetes. And here's one with diabetes, so here's the sugar going way up. And this is what the insulin does. So here's the control, nice little burst of insulin coming down, cystic fibrosis with normal glucose tolerance. Um, their, insulin, their insulin is certainly going up. And here's a diabetic, a delayed insulin peak, much later than the control. Now this slide is one of my patients. This ended up being published. This isn't very... Um, <laughs> final looking figure, but, but this is a really dramatic um, representation of what the blood sugars do. So you can take, uh, here's a non-CF patient who's eating breakfast and then eating lunch, and this is what their blood sugars do. They actually don't go above 130. They're pretty normal um, all day long. But you can take a patient with CF-related diabetes who has a very normal fasting blood sugar, and as long as they don't eat, they'll stay. They can be 80, 90, totally normal. But when they eat, they go up to here, over 250. This might be a little different from the one that got published, because the one that got published was eating all night, and he was up in the 350s all night long. Very, very dramatic. Um, and so when you see a high blood sugar in the morning on a patient with CF, the first thing you think about was, well, what did you have at night to eat? And you, that doesn't mean you need to start them on Lantus or a long-acting insulin. That is probably food. They're very, very sensitive to food. Um, but when the food effect goes away, the blood sugar will come back down to normal. Now, insulin resistance is the thing that's kind of the first abnormality that occurs in the adult-onset diabetics or the type 2 diabetics. And there's a lot of debate about whether patients with cystic fibrosis have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance means that the insulin doesn't work well. Um, and so the studies on this are mixed. Uh, there aren't very many of them, really, looking at it carefully. But some show a normal insulin sensitivity and some show decreased insulin sensitivity. Based on my experience, these guys are very, very insulin sensitive, just like you would expect from a thin individual, right? As, as people become obese, they become insulin resistant. But when you're thin or active, you're very insulin sensitive, except for certain situations. When, when individuals are sick, they become insulin resistant. And so if, when a CF patient is sick, and if they're studied at a time when they're sick, it can skew, you know, the results of the study, which is why the studies, I think, are mixed. But when they're infected, they become insulin resistant, and they will require 
two to four fold or even more times their normal insulin dose because they're resistant to the insulin's effect, the insulin's ability to lower the glucose. Patients, when they, um, when they take glucocorticoids, prednisone, they become insulin resistant. When the blood sugars are really high for a long time, which doesn't usually happen in CF, but, but say they were sick in the hospital for a long time and no one was really controlling their blood sugars, that shouldn't happen. The high glucose itself can cause insulin resistance. And then any other acute medical illness. And increasingly, data suggests that hypoxia by itself can cause insulin resistance. So, so CF patients are normally very insulin sensitive uh, unless some of these things are going on, in which case they can become insulin resistant. Okay, so just to finish how CF-related uh, diabetes differs from other kinds of diabetes, so there are these dramatic post-meal excursions in blood sugar despite relatively normal fasting glucose. Uh, they do not get de diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. Um, they are insulin sensitive in the absence of other contributing factors, as we just discussed. And there is no need to calorie or carbohydrate restrict or lose weight. The goal for these patients is to maintain their weight, or sometimes they're trying to gain. So we try to match the carbohydrate intake with insulin as needed. We do not withhold food and carbs. Uh, which is what I mentioned, frustrates a patient sometimes when they get treated like another kind of diabetes. Um, so moving on to the clin clinical significance. So we talked about why, how we get CF diabetes and why it's different from the other kinds of diabetes. And now I want to talk about why we care about the high sugars, which is also different from other kinds of diabetes. So um, first of all, the mortality rate is increased in patients who are affected by diabetes. So there's a six-fold increase in mortality in patients who have CF diabetes versus CF without diabetes. Um, we don't know if the diabetes is causing that. That's an association. Uh, but uh, this, this was shown previously, and then there was another recent study um, corroborating that that looked at 520 um, UK adults who had CF who had had at least one hemoglobin A1C tested. So it's not all CF patients, it's patients who might have raised some suspicion about having diabetes because they had to have an A1C tested. But this study showed that an A1C above 6.5, which is in the very early diabetic range, um, was associated with a 3.3-fold increased mortality after adjustment for other risk factors compared to patients whose A1C was below that. So again, if they had compared them to in all comers, not just those who were tested for an A1C, they could have even seen a higher relative risk. So there's clearly an increased mortality. You know, does that just mean that the disease is more advanced or that they have this medical stress from hypoxia and more severe pulmonary infections um, that's leading to the hyperglycemia? It could be that. I mean, it could be just an association. Um, and we'll get more, um, we'll address that a little bit more in a second. So this study showed that the survival was particularly decreased in females affected by diabetes. So here you can see the black bar. This is a survival um, distribution over age. The black is patient, women who did not have CF uh, diabetes. They're all CF patients. And the red are the women with CF who did have diabetes. And you can see a dramatic difference in mortality or survival in the women. The green and the blue represent the men with and without diabetes. Um, again, everybody had CF, and there didn't appear to be a difference um, amongst the men. Um, another interesting point from this study um, showed that patients who were diagnosed with diabetes without fasting hyperglycemia. So, you know, we can we're going to do diagnosis in a minute, but you can diagnose diabetes based on a post-challenge glucose. So, like after a glucose drink or after a meal, if the sugar gets high you can get diagnosed with diabetes, even if the fasting sugar is normal, right? And I showed you those pictures of how the fasting can be normal. So it's kind of an earlier stage. So in the patients who were diagnosed with diabetes but still had no without fasting hyperglycemia, so they still had a normal fasting glucose, 40% progressed to have fasting hyperglycemia over an average of a year and a half. And that's important because a lot of my patients come in with this presentation of early diabetes, and, I, and they want to know, well, am I ever going to really need to take insulin? How, what's going to happen to this diabetes? But that's the average. So 40% progress over an average of about a year and a half. Okay, so 
so why do we care about it? We, we showed the mortality, you know, in association. In the other kinds of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, we care about microvascular disease, and we care about macrovascular disease. Microvascular disease is disease of small blood vessels and nerves that affect uh, three main organs. Uh, one is the eye. So diabetic retinopathy um, can lead to blindness. And maintaining normal or lower blood glucose levels can dramatically decrease the progression of that by 70%. Um, now, does this happen to patients with CF? There are three reports showing that patients who have had CF diabetes for at least 10 years have 15, one showed 15%, one showed 5%, and one showed 16% prevalence of diabetic retinopathy. I now have, <laughs> after having seen these patients for about you know, 13 years, I have two patients who have very early diabetic retinopathy. My gut impression is that they do not get it like the other kinds of diabetics. They are getting a little whiff of diabetic retinopathy, they are not requiring major laser surgery and going blind. And that is probably because for many years during the early stages of diabetes, their blood sugar is coming back to normal on its own as compared to these other diabetics who can be high all night long, all day long. So, but it can happen. So it is a risk from CF-related diabetes and we need to maintain normal glucose levels in order to prevent this. Um, kidney disease, very um, uncommon CF-related diabetes. This is um, what can ultimately lead to dialysis. Diabetes is one of the leading causes of dialysis in the country, um, but it's not that common among CF patients. Um, in the nerves, you may have heard of peripheral neuropathy. It's um, um, numbness and tingling that starts in the toes in a stocking and glove distribution. It next can affect the fingers and can lead to instability and ultimately ulcers and amputations and other kinds of diabetes. In CF-related diabetes, it's also not that common and not that severe, but that it can happen. So, um, so these things are important. They're there. They're not the primary concern that we have, um, which is going to be on the next slide. Now, in type 2 and type 1 diabetes, macrovascular disease, which refers to disease of the large vessels, so that's stroke and heart attack and disease. Uh, it's also, there's one called peripheral arterial disease, a disease in the large vessels that supply the legs. The number one cause of death in type 2 diabetes is, and in type 1 diabetes, is a heart attack or cardiovascular disease. So we are very aggressive. We treat the cholesterol. We treat the blood pressure. You know, it's a very large part of managing that kind of diabetes because that's what they're going to die from. It is not described in CF-related diabetes. So we don't need to be so worried about ordering treadmill tests or treating the cholesterol with Lipitor and things like that. In fact, the cholesterol is very low in the patients with CF due to their, you know, low body weight and their malabsorption of fats. Um, and that may, in fact, be one of the reasons why they don't get macrovascular disease. But that's very important to keep in mind. So why, um, why do we care about the diabetes, and why do we want to treat the blood sugars? These are the primary reasons. One is a declining body mass index. So maintaining a normal body weight is very important in cystic fibrosis patients. Um, it correlates with mortality and pulmonary function. Now, when um, the blood sugar is over 180, uh, we exceed the threshold in the kidney to reabsorb glucose. So we start to lose glucose in the urine and glucose is calories. So patients with uncontrolled diabetes, you may have heard of somebody who presented not usually with CF diabetes where it's more subtle, but a different kind of diabetes like the juvenile onset especially, they lose a whole bunch of weight. They can present with 30 pounds weight loss. That's because they're losing calories in the urine. And we, um, while this happens to a more subtle degree in CF-related diabetes, that's important because we don't want to lose weight. Um, so we want, we, we sort of said, it's a little bit theoretical, but we have set a goal of 180 as a number to always stay below in CF-related diabetes. Um, so the other um, thing that happens with diabetes is if patients are starting to check their blood sugar, Sometimes they're scared to eat because they don't want to see those high numbers. So um, that's something to consider um, when you're starting to monitor for diabetes. Um, and interestingly, even before the monitoring starts, um, 
like if, I'll show you a study in a minute, the body mass index starts to decline two to three years before the diagnosis of diabetes. So there's just this sort of decline that starts. The body mass index goes down, the sugars are smoldering around the diabetic level. Even before the diabetes is, di is diagnosed, usually at the time that the fasting blood sugar is high, because everyone's used to checking fasting blood sugars. Um, another thing that happens um, in the setting of diabetes is muscle loss. So insulin is an anabolic hormone. It's the fed hormone. It's a hormone that's secreted when we eat, we store fat, we lay down amino acids in our muscle, and um, we store glucose in our liver and our muscle. When insulin is low, it means we're fasted. Typically, a low insulin represents the fasted state. And when you're fasted, you're mobilizing stored fuels. And you start to break down muscle. Um, and so when a patient is diabetic, it's like they're in the fasted state, even when they're not. So you, we call it a catabolic state. It's a breakdown state. They're mobilizing glucose from their liver. That's why a patient can be high, um, hyperglycemic when they wake up. Um, even if they didn't eat anything. Not in CF, but in other patients who are insulin deficient because their body thinks they're needing to mobilize all this stored glucose all the time. So, um, so it's a catabolic state and muscle, um, muscle loss occurs. So insulin deficiency leads to the breakdown of muscle or failure to lay down more muscle after eating. And uh, we end up with a decrease in lean body mass, um, including the muscles of respiration, which may be the link between CF-related diabetes and a decline in pulmonary function. This is the most important clinical consequence of diabetes um, because CF patients die from pulmonary function, not heart attacks, or not pulmonary function, pulmonary disease, not heart attacks. Uh, but the decline in PFTs um, starts to appear several years before the diagnosis of diabetes. So again, declining body mass index, declining FEV1 and pulmonary function as the sugars are starting to rise. And after the diagnosis of diabetes, the pulmonary function tests continue to deteriorate at a much more rapid rate than a non-diabetic patient with CF. Um, here is a bar graph showing the percent uh, predicted FEV1 in over 7,000 CF patients with or without diabetes by age group. So here are the different age groups. And the blue is a CF patient without diabetes, and the green is CF with diabetes. And you can see in every age group, the FEV1 is decreased in those with diabetes compared to without. So are there other possible links between diabetes or hyperglycemia and pulmonary decline? Uh, glucose is directly toxic to the alveoli, which are the little sacs um, in your lungs, um, and it may stimulate inflammation. Uh, it may um, potentiate infections by decreasing um, immune function. So, I mean, in, in other kinds of diabetes, we know you're at risk for urinary tract infections and skin infections when the blood sugar is uncontrolled, and it may be the same for pulmonary infections, although we haven't really been able to prove that. Um, and proteolysis or protein breakdown was, um, has been sort of the leading theory, which I just described, uh, which is increased breakdown in diabetes due to decreased insulin, um, which is important for the muscles of respiration. Here's a slide showing the decrease in protein um, accretion or the increase in protein breakdown in patients with CF diabetes. So this is a study by Hardin. Uh, she looked at 29 adult CF patients and 18 matched controls. They did these um, stable isotope studies where they can look at turnover of, of proteins. Um, and they found that, here's a clinical status score on the bottom. So the lower the clinical status score, the higher the protein breakdown. So there's a very strong correlation uh, between protein breakdown and clinical status, leading support to that particular theory about why diabetes might lead to a decline in pulmonary function. Okay, any questions? All right, we, we can do, I, I think we can do them at the end probably. Okay, so then moving on to prevalence. So um, this is data from the University of Minnesota. Um, what you can see here are by age, the prevalence of different kinds of diabetes or glucose abnormalities. So starting with the five to nine-year-olds, the dark blue 
is NGT, which is normal glucose tolerant. These people have completely normal glucoses after a glucose challenge. Um, you know what a glucose tolerance test is. You have to drink 75 grams of, of glucose um, and see if it raises your blood sugar. It's a stress test for diabetes. So 57% were completely normal. 34% had normal fasting, but they got a little high after that glucose drink to a level that we consider impaired glucose tolerant, which is also considered pre-diabetic. These individuals have a higher rate of converting to diabetes. Um, and 6% had a normal fasting blood sugar, but after the glucose drink got high enough to qualify as diabetic. And only 3% actually had fasting hyperglycemia. In the 10 to 19 year olds, the prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance is 38%, and now we've got 15 and 11% of uh, diabetes without fasting and with fasting hyperglycemia. So kind of a big jump there. And as people get older, you know, by the time you're over 20, you've got only 23% um, of individuals who have completely normal glucose tolerance. Does that seem abnormal to you? These are young, thin individuals. Um, at Stanford, we actually compared them to our own database of individuals who were matched to, by age and weight. So we compared our CF patients at Stanford, 128, to non-CF patients from my lab. Um, and everybody was, you know, had to have a fasting glucose of under 100, and they had to be under 30, and they all were matched for their body mass index. I can't remember exactly what it was, but they were lean. And guess what? None of the patients without CF had any abnormality in response to the glucose tolerance test. 100% were normal. But look at the CF patients. So uh, what is it? 32% were abnormal. These guys had impaired glucose tolerance and these guys actually had um, normal fasting by definition. We required that, but they were diabetic in response to the glucose tolerance test. I put this slide in here just to show you the contrast because it's not normal to have any glucose intolerance at that age and weight. So a prevalence summary for you, a little take home message is that in CF patients over 20 years of age, 15% have fasting hyperglycemia. 40% will qualify as diabetic based on either fasting or uh, oral glucose tolerance testing, where the fasting is normal, but the two hour is over 200. And 70% will have elevations in their post meals or their post glucose tolerance test that are diabetic or borderline. So only 30% are normal um, over the age of 20. And which factors are associated with developing CF-related diabetes? Everybody who gets diabetes has pancreatic insufficiency. 100% of patients who have diabetes have pancreatic insufficiency. Not everyone with pancreatic insufficiency has diabetes, but remember the impairment of the beta cell is secondary to the disease in the exocrine pancreas. Um, some you know, severity of the gene mutations can predispose to diabetes and increasing age. It's not associated with gender, even though I said that once you have it, it seems that females may do more poorly as a result of having the diabetes. So in the graph you showed earlier where there were 30% um, who were normal above the age of 30, were those pancreatic sufficient? Did those include pancreatic sufficient patients? Those included, um, yes, I think those included everybody. Those, those are all their CF patients. Okay, and then factors associated with prognosis. Uh, you know, this may be a little bit outdated. I, I couldn't find a new number for this um, today when I was looking, but uh, CF-related diabetes median survival is, is much less than the non-diabetes survival. When I did this slide from this number, this was 35. Um, so this has gone up, and this may have gone up, but I, I haven't seen any new numbers. Female sex, again, associated with worse outcome in the setting of CF-related diabetes, lower BMI, lower FEV1 are all predictors of a poor prognosis. So um, we now are getting more attention from the diabetes organizations. And recently, in 2010, there was a position statement issued. So the last time there had been any kind of consensus on how to diagnose and screen for CF diabetes was 1998. So this is the uh, CF Foundation 1998 definition 
of CF related diabetes and I've been alluding to it throughout the talk. Um, but first we have CF related diabetes um, which can be diagnosed like any other kind of diabetes uh, with a fasting glucose of 126 on two or more occasions. But we talked about how that's at a pretty late stage, right, by the time the fasting blood sugar is high. Um, or a casual glucose, so any random glucose if the patient's, you know, at home checking or in the hospital checking um, of 200 or greater on two or more occasions. Um, or 200 or greater after the 75 gram glucose um, challenge, which is called the glucose tolerance test. Then there was this other cat category called CF related diabetes without fasting hyperglycemia. Um, these guys had a normal fasting glucose defined as less than 126, but they were 200 or greater in response to a glucose tolerance test or, or just a random glucose or a meal. And so the first group, there wasn't a lot of controversy about how to treat them. They just were getting treated with insulin or whatever to, you know, for their diabetes. But there was some controversy about whether or not to treat this group as aggressively um, as the other group. In 2010, um, this position statement came out and changed this a little bit. So the diagnosis, they decided that it doesn't matter whether or not you have fasting hyperglycemia. And you don't need to split these two groups you know, to with or without fasting hyperglycemia because both groups, and I'll show you um, the slides in a minute, both groups show pulmonary decline um, in the setting of the high sugars, whether or not there's a high fasting blood sugar, and both groups respond to insulin therapy. So they didn't feel like they needed to split the two groups. Um, but the so the diagnosis is a fasting of 126 or greater, or a two-hour post-glucola, 75-gram glucose drink, of 200 or greater. This is the same as any other kind of diabetes, um, and you have to repeat it. Or a, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% or higher. That's also a new um, diagnostic criteria for the other kinds of diabetes. However, in CF, um, if you have an a A1C less than 6.5, it certainly does not rule out diabetes. If it's high, it can suggest it. Um, and it can actually make the diagnosis. But if it's low, it does not rule it out because there are a number of studies showing that the A1C under, is, is lower than the glucoses. It kind of can underestimate the number of patients who have diabetes. Um, again, that's the A1C, do you guys know what the A1C is? The A1C is the amount of glucose that's coating the hemoglobin on the red blood cells. And the red blood cells live for 120 days. So it ends up being an average of the total blood exposure to glucose every minute of the day over the last three months. So it's different from the finger sticks, which are a single point in time. So we, we like to monitor this um, when we're managing diabetics. It's very new to be able to actually diagnose someone with that. All right, so, do, so here are some other new things, which I think are nice that they actually outlined other ways to diagnose the diabetes. So during acute illness, requiring IV antibiotics or glucocorticoids if the fasting sugar is 126 or greater or the two hour post meal is over 200 for at least 48 hours they can be diagnosed with CF related diabetes. And during continuous um, enteral feed, so a tube feed, um, if the mid feed or immediately after the feed blood glucose is 200 or greater they can also be diagnosed with diabetes. So this position statement also included guidelines for screening. Uh, there had been a lack of, you know, over the, throughout the country, kind of a general lack of performing the glucose tolerance tests. Um, and as we've been discussing, relying on a fasting glucose finds the diabetes far too late. Um, but the, the comments relating to the outpatient screening were that the A1C has a low correlation with the glucose tolerance tests. It can underestimate the level of glycemia, and therefore normal value does not rule out cystic fibrosis-related di diabetes. We will use the A1C for monitoring um, once they're diagnosed, and if it's high, it can help you diagnose them, but do not hang your hat on a low value. Um, fasting glucose misses CF-related uh, diabetes, um, the kind that doesn't have fasting hyperglycemia. So again, don't rely on a fasting glucose. The ideal test is the two-hour 75-gram glucose tolerance test, which they're doing regularly at Stanford. 
This should be administered every year starting at age 10. Um, the other times when this test should be administered are prior to transplant. So if there are a patient's about to get a lung transplant and they haven't had one within six months, it should be done then. Virtually all patients become diabetic like in that immediate post-transplant period on the high-dose steroids. Um, I don't know if they all stay diabetic. I don't think they all will stay diabetic, but many do because um, the steroids will taper after the transplant. Um, during pregnancy, they should be screened, so at 12 weeks and also 12 weeks after delivery. And there's some different numbers for diagnosing diabetes in pregnancy. The other time that um, patients should be monitored for diabetes or screened are during acute illnesses. So if a patient is admitted for acute pulmonary infection and they didn't have diabetes, they should have their finger sticks monitored for the first 48 hours, and then if they're normal, they can stop monitoring after that. Um, the same thing with tube feeds. If they come into the hospital, start on tube feeds, they should be monitored uh, for the first 48 hours. And the best times to check are in the middle of the tube feed and, again, right after the tube feed is over. Okay, so now we can move on to treatment. Um, uh, so the, the only endorsed treatment is insulin therapy. So I'm going to tell you that, you know, at the outset, and I'm going to talk about um, a lot. There isn't really a lot of published information on the best way to treat with insulin, so I can give you my personal insights on that. But let's talk about the effect of insulin on the pulmonary decline. So here is um, the first study that came out that was very impressive that was more than six or seven patients. So this is an, actually a relatively large trial for CF um, in 42 patients. It's an observational trial, so it's not a randomized um, you know, placebo-controlled trial. It's an observational trial. So there were um, 42 patients. Their records were reviewed from the time of diagnosis um, with diabetes, which was defined as a random blood sugar of 200 or greater. Uh, their mean age was 21 years old, and they were 27 females and 15 males. Um, 31 of these subjects at the time of diagnosis received a rapid-acting insulin. So that's um, Lyspro or Novolog or Humalog um, or Aspart. Those are the names. So they, those are the ones you take right with the food. Um, nine of them received a combination of rapid-acting and long-acting, and three um, received... Looks like I didn't put it on there, but I think it was three received just the long-acting alone. So the majority received that rapid-acting insulin that you take with food. Uh, the pulmonary function test and the hemoglobin A1C and the body mass index were monitored for three years after starting the therapy and five years prior. And I love this curve. I think a picture is always worth a thousand words. This is where the patients were diagnosed and, and began treatment. This is their FEV1 percent of predicted. So, like I said, they went back and got records for five years prior to diagnosis and then three years after they started therapy with insulin. So you can see even before they got diagnosed, there was a steady decline in the FEV1 even before anybody knew they had diabetes. At the time they were diagnosed, the A1C was 6.8. So what was happening in here was probably what we've been talking about earlier, the normal fasting blood sugar but getting a little high after you eat progressively, because those patients don't have an A1C this high. Their A1Cs are around 6, 5.9, 6. But by the time they got diagnosed, they had fasting, hyperglycemia, and clearly high random glucoses. And um, they started insulin. And the FEV1 initially went up dramatically um, at three months, and then it started to decline at about the same rate. But by the time it reached the same point at which they had started, it was 34 months later. So treatment with insulin basically gave the patients, in terms of FEV1, 34 months. It reversed the decline. Um, and at 30, by the time 34 months had gone by, they were where they had started. That's a lot of time, 34 months in medicine. We do interventions to get one day. 34 months is amazing. So... Then there was the question about, well, what about these patients who had normal, these earlier patients, normal fasting but high post-glucola uh, blood sugars? Should we treat them? And, this, and remember I told you that when they did this last position statement, they didn't want to distinguish between those with fasting and without fasting hyperglycemia. 
And it's based on a couple of little studies like this, not big studies, but here's one of the little studies showing the same thing. These are patients who had normal fasting uh, blood sugar but high post meals. At the time that they got diagnosed, um, you can see there was already a decline in the FEV1 that reversed at the initiation of insulin therapy. This is a much smaller, you know, trial, but shows the same thing. So that was great. Insulin can actually help with the pulmonary function. What about pills? Can we give pills to these patients? They don't really get all excited to take insulin shots. Um, so here's a study where they actually looked at repaglinide, which is a pill that can uh, cause your pancreas to make more insulin. So here we can see patients, uh, this is the uh, insulin level in the blood in patients who are controls. So these are patients who, I think these guys had a mixed meal. So they had a meal and the insulin goes up in the controls and then it goes down. And again, <coughs> these are all the patients um, at baseline, these squares, there's a patient with CF diabetes um, at baseline who didn't take anything. Again a delayed and diminished insulin response. That's why they're diabetic. Um, and then if they took insulin Lyspro, this is their insulin response. And if they took repaglinide, the pill, here's their insulin response. So these don't look that different. Let's see what their blood sugars did. So here is the control, not, you know, not elevated glucose. Here is the patient that took the insulin, the Lyspro. And here is the patient that took um, nothing. This is the baseline. So they're high, and here's the repaglinide. So the insulin is clearly lowering the blood sugar better than the repaglinide. That's just one study. Um, and then they did a randomized controlled trial. This was the first randomized controlled trial in CF-related diabetes without fasting hyperglycemia. So they were really focused on this group who didn't have blatant fasting hyperglycemia. Should we be treating these guys? So this study is a little bit disappointing um, in that it didn't show more dramatic results, but it did show a couple of things. So there were 81 adults um, with CF without fasting hyperglycemia who were either diabetic um, with the two-hour sugar being 200 or greater, or they were almost diabetic. They call it severe impaired glucose tolerance, severe IGT, where the two-hour was just under 200, but at one hour they got over 200. And they were randomized to pre-meal insulin, um, at, with aspart, where they did, this is called a carb ratio, so it's one unit for every 30 grams of carbohydrate. That allows flexible dosing according to how much carbohydrate you eat. Um, or repaglinide, the pills, two milligrams every meal. Can you see how different this is? This is totally flexible dosing. If you eat a big pancake breakfast, you take a lot of insulin. Here, you're taking the same dose every meal, and I think that's why that study didn't show anything, because you're just taking a fixed dose. So, of course, you might not control the blood sugar as well. If you could, with repaglinide, you can actually dose flexibly. You could take multiple pills if you wanted based on the size of your meal, but it's hard. You know, they didn't do the study that way. Um, they did, in, in all of these cases, if they, if they were really out of control on the repaglinide, they had a certain cutoff blood sugar, they would increase the dose. But it's still not flexible, you know, with the patient controlling it like the insulin. Um, and then they compared them to placebo. So uh, the endpoints were the 12, at one year, the body mass index, the FEV1, uh, DEXA scan for bone density, and um, an NIH prognostic score, and some other things that I, I'm not really going to even talk about because they didn't show anything. So let me show you what it did show. So um, the group that got assigned to the insulin had an increase in BMI, this is a p-value, a significant increase in BMI of about 0.4 kilos at one year compared to the repaglinide, um, who did not have a, it was a non-significant increase in body mass index and placebo, didn't change. The FVC and the FEV1, you can see these are all the p-values here. A p-value under 0.05 is considered statistically significant. So you can see that, you know, this went down a little bit on insulin, this went down a little more, this went down, down, down a little more. But none of these were statistically significant compared to the baseline. So it wasn't thought that any intervention affected anything to do with pulmonary function. It takes a long time to see changes in pulmonary function, at least a year. And these guys, remember, they weren't that hyperglycemic. And in fact, when they looked at the hemoglobin A1Cs of these guys, there was no significant change. So sometimes studies that are negative are negative because there wasn't enough difference between the groups or because they didn't 
um, have enough pretest probability of having an event. You know, there are various reasons. Um, but there was this significant finding, so that the insulin was helpful for BMI, so they call it a nutritional benefit in patients without fasting hyperglycemia. And this is actually part of why the recommendations changed to lump all these CF diabetes together and recommended insulin treatment for them. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? I'm going back to that position statement. Okay, here's the other thing that was found um, that leads these organizations to say, no, you can't use pills, you need to use insulin. The repaglinide, not only did it not show any benefit, but the repaglinide compared to placebo had a significantly worse effect on BMI um, in the patients who were almost diabetic, the severe impaired glucose tolerance patients. So this is the only significant um, you know, thing in, in the BMI here. So the repaglinide fared worse than the placebo. Um, okay, so, so the organizations endorse insulin only because only insulin's been shown to improve the pulmonary function or the nutritional status. That being said, and I agree with insulin, and I promote insulin. However, I will use pills as a bridge to insulin in many patients, and in patients who have a hardship with insulin, um, I will use some pills. And there are patients who do have trouble with insulin. I mean, insulin can cause hypoglycemia. And if you want to take insulin safely, you really can't take a fixed dose. You have to do flexible dosing, which means you have to count carbs. And that can be hard for patients. There are some patients who cannot do it, and they tried, and they end up having severe hypoglycemia because they can't get it right, um, or they don't eat when they thought they were going to eat after they dosed. And for those patients, um, I will try to do a pill, um, or I'll do a pill with a little bit of background long-acting insulin. So there, there are pills out there that can be used. And I, I do agree these studies were negative, but I also agree, you know, I also believe that the studies were somewhat imperfect when looking at the, glu the pills. Theoretically, if you could lower the glucose just as much with a pill, so in someone who had very mild early diabetes, then they should get the same benefit. But we don't see that, and, and the pills really are limited. I, I don't think, you know, as the diabetes advances, that any of the pills would really do the job. Um, we do have sulfonylureas. Um, there's a risk of hypoglycemia. I do not really use these drugs very much. They're very long-acting. Um, I'm just too worried they're going to get hypoglycemia. Uh, Repaglinide and Starlix are much more expensive than the sulfonylureas. I actually do use these drugs sometimes. That is not any standard of care. That's just me because they're shorter acting and they're easier to titrate. So you can do a low dose and a high dose of this one if you're having a small meal or a big meal. Uh, this one you can take one to four pills depending on how big your meal is or how, you know, how much carb is in your meal. But these again are really a bridge to insulin. So when someone is first diagnosed and they're um, starting to think about the diabetes but they don't want to be checking their blood sugar and carb counting and taking shots all the time, we'll use these for a little while. Um, Bieta is a drug that I've seen being used mostly in patients who are coming up from San Diego, which is where Amelin Pharmaceuticals is. Um, I do not think this is a good drug for patients with CF because it causes weight loss and a lot of GI side effects, and it slows gastric emptying. It's like the worst drug I can think of. I mean, it, you know, they already have slow, you know, gastric emptying and problems related to their bowels and, um, and, tr and weight loss. So I, I wouldn't really want to use that drug. Um, Genuvia is another drug that causes, it doesn't cause hypoglycemia. It actually acts on the same pathway as the Bieta. It it causes your body to make more insulin in response to a glucose elevation. And so both of these drugs cause a post-meal spike in insulin in proportion to the degree of glucose that you know, the pancreas is seeing, or the gut is seeing, actually. So, so this is kind of an interesting drug. This is not approved for use. I think that in the patient who cannot take insulin, it's an option. It's the best option in someone with mild enough CF-related diabetes because... So what, I, what I've done is in patients who really can't do this carb counting in the multiple doses a day, I put them on a little bit of long-acting insulin and Genuvia, which targets or minimizes the post-meal spikes. Um, diet, uh, diet is important. As I mentioned, we really they, patients need to eat to maintain or gain weight following, following the standard CF dietary recommendations. We don't do an 1,800-calorie diet. We don't do an ADA diet. 
We don't tell them to stop eating Skittles, although sometimes I'm tempted. Uh, Scandy shakes are very glucose elevating. A lot of the p foods that the patients eat, you know, they eat whatever they want because they're always trying to gain weight. But there are a lot of simple sugars and carbs that probably are not the best for their diabetes. But at the at the current time, you know, and I stand by this, the recommendation is to just do whatever the CF team and nutritionist is, is recommending. In order to optimize diet for blood sugars, we can do a couple of things. One is make sure that the meals are mixed. That means protein, fat, and carb in the same meal as opposed to a pure carb meal. Um, fat is good for um, another reason, which is that it slows the absorption of the glucose. So that early spike in glucose that the CF patients get um, it doesn't happen so dramatically. It's a slower, you know, a slower rise and then a slower fall on the glucose. So adding fat is a great way to add calories and gain weight. Um, and so instead of withholding anything to lower the blood sugars, instead I'll say, well, add fat to that meal because you're getting high after breakfast every day. Um, another thing that patients can do, um, <laughs> I mean, the patients with CF, as you know, eat a lot of small meals. They snack, you know, graze all day long, and that can be really hard when you have to shoot insulin every single time. I mean, there are insulin pumps. I wasn't going to get into that here. But for patients who aren't interested in a pump, uh, what you can do is for some of the snacks, you can have a snack that does not require a shot. So these are carb-free snacks. They can have protein and fat, but foods um, such as cheese, peanut butter, nuts, avocado, meat, and eggs do not require a shot. So they can have a snack. They can get their calories, but they don't have to take a shot with that snack. So, you know, they could eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and maybe the mid-morning snack would have carbs and get an extra shot, but maybe the afternoon snack would be a, a non-carb, non-shot um, snack. And that's also something to do at bedtime if, you know, you're getting these really high blood sugars in the morning is to, to have a no-carb snack. Um, so, and, and then I think I already made this point, that we don't cut carbohydrates to avoid, avoid um, high blood sugars. Instead, we add fat to the meals and try to have mixed meals. Um, I did not really, I just want to mention exercise in here. CF patients, just like any other diabetic patients, can get hypoglycemic from exercise. So if there is planned activity, whatever dose of insulin is being given, or, or even if it's a pill, should be reduced. I mean, it can either be held or it can be reduced by about half because for the same meal um, and the same dose, they will get hypoglycemic. All right, so... Um, Insulin, moving on to insulin, is the only approved um, therapy in the 2010 position statement. Um, I will start the patients very quickly if I get somebody in the hospital or they come to clinic, get them with the educator, and we start carb counting right away, unless they're resistant, in which case I'll do the pill bridge to insulin thing. So we'll start with um, a carb count. A typical starting place is maybe one unit of insulin for every 30 or maybe 60 grams of carbohydrate. So different meals will have different amount of carbohydrate, and then they have different units. Uh, but it's really great. It's very flexible dosing, and patients can eat whatever they want. Um, I will add Lantus, which is a long-acting insulin, only if the blood sugar is high in the morning in the absence of uncovered food at night. Most, I, have, I can't tell you how many patients I have, they come to me on a lot of Lantus, and eventually they'll be hospitalized and they'll be NPO for something or another and their insulin requirement will become zero. So all that long-acting insulin they were on was covering grazing, and it's okay to do it, except it can be dangerous if they stop eating. So I do not, I try to be pure with my insulin dosing and have the long-acting insulin truly be their requirement for overnight and in the absence of food, and all the food is being treated with this rapid-acting bolus insulin. But sometimes for patients who really graze a lot throughout the day, it's okay to have a little bit of this, um, a little bit, not all of it, but a little bit of the long-acting insulin on board as long as you realize if that patient gets admitted and they're MPO for bowel obstruction, you're going to need to cut back. Um, at home, I tell my patients, and this is not a guideline that I found anywhere, to check their one-hour post-meal glucose. You probably didn't notice, but if you look back at the figures, the peak glucose in CF patients is the one-hour post-meal or the one-hour post-glucose drink. And since we're always trying to stay under 180, I tell them to check the one-hour post, 
and our goal is to keep it under 180. If they're always over 180 or on average over 180, then we might need to adjust the therapy. So that's usually their carb ratio. So if they're taking one unit for every 30 grams, maybe they need one unit for every 20 grams of carbohydrate. We do monitor the A1C. The um, position statement or the standard goal for um, patients with CF is under 7. I'm not sure what that's based on exactly, but um, you know that's always a moving target for all diabetics. But right now it's under 7. Um, and then we can add a sliding scale, which is an um, insulin given for high blood sugars. But, but you know, compared to other diabetes, we really don't rely on this very much. The mainstay of the treatment is this carb counting. So patients with CF diabetes need a lot of insulin for carbs, but they do not need a lot of insulin to bring down a high blood sugar. I, I put down here a ratio of 100. What this means is one unit will drop their sugar 100 points in the absence of food. I mean, they're very, very huge drops from one unit of insulin in the absence of food. So we have to be very careful about using that. Okay, so, so as I explain it to the residents who are training with me, that they're Patients with CF-related diabetes are very carb intolerant, but they're very insulin sensitive. So the mainstay of insulin is for the food that they're eating, as opposed to reacting to a high blood sugar and giving units to bring it down. And I think it's easy for the patients to remember a single number. So one hour post, we always want to keep it under 180. Um, so, okay, so then here's the official, um, this is the last slide the 2010 position statement on treatment. So only insulin is endorsed. It is recommended that they self-monitor their blood sugar over three, you know, three or more times a day to be safe if they're taking multiple doses of insulin. The diabetes education should meet national standards for all diabetics. Uh, they should be seen quarterly by a specialized multidisciplinary team that includes somebody who can treat diabetes. Um, the A1C should be done every three months. The goal is under seven. Um, they should get exercise, they should get hypoglycemia education and have a glucagon emergency kit, which is a, a treatment that can bring up your sugar if it's very low and you can't drink juice. They should get annual monitoring for microvascular complications, so that means eye exams, monitoring the uh, kidney function with a urine test, um, and these should start about five years after diagnosis. And if, if they are found to have these kind of complications, they should be treated the same as a, any other kind of diabetic. Um, and then they do recommend an annual lipid profile that's checking the cholesterol. As I mentioned, um, they don't usually have high cholesterol and they haven't had any reported cases of heart disease. So this is only really necessary if they have a risk factor. So if they're obese or they have a family history of heart disease or if they have been transplanted. Once they get transplanted, they start to have high cholesterols from the drugs. So it's nice that there are actual guidelines out there because um, there weren't. Um, and I think they'll continue to progress as we hopefully get more data on outcomes and responses to different interventions. Uh, so in summary, uh, glucose intolerance diabetes is common in patients with CF. Remember, 70% of some kind of abnormality. And it starts with normal fasting but high post-meal uh, glucose excursions. Mortality has increased three to six-fold in CF patients who do have diabetes. Um, and the pulmonary decline starts even before fasting hyperglycemia develops. Uh, treatment with insulin slows the pulmonary decline by up to 34 months um, and improves the body mass index. Oral agents, drip pills, have not been proven to do the same, so insulin's the ideal therapy. Um, and subjects with CF are very carbohydrate intolerant but relatively insulin sensitive and they require carb-dosed mealtime insulin to allow them to eat freely and flexibly um, to maintain their body weight and to avoid the risk of hypoglycemia. All right, well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>the first one, um, it has been suggested to us to start our daughter on an insulin pump. She is eight and a half years old and was diagnosed about one year ago. I'm really nervous because we count carbs to determine insulin and afraid she's too young. Any thoughts? Um, well, the insulin pumps are routinely used in kids with type 1 diabetes and um, they manage it. 
Um, they, you know, I'm not a pediatric endocrinologist, so I don't see those kids, but it's in routine practice to use them in kids that are probably starting around that age, you know, when they can push the buttons themselves. Um, if she, you know, I don't really see any reason not to use it. It's probably easier for her than having to take a shot multiple times a day if she's eating. So um, I, I would see no reason why she can't do that as long as everybody learns how to use the pump um, and the school is alerted to that. Um, and she should always carry the insulin with her, you know, in case the pump malfunctions. But um, if, if the patient's willing to do it, then she, it's just a delivery system. So it, it allows you to be, to, to avoid all those multiple shots. Um, another one is, um, what can we refer or give doctors to inform them about CFRD? What can we give them? Well, I, I give them lectures. Um, <laughs> You know, they know so little about it. I really, it's really, I think there should be some, you know, I don't know what works. I mean, public health campaigns don't seem to work in general. So uh, I, think, I think as it becomes more recognized by these societies, actually, it's, it's, it will help. Because now more articles are being published in diabetes care and some of the major journals. They're talking about it at the endocrine meetings instead of just the CF meetings. And so there's a little bit more um, generalized awareness. And when they come up with position statements and things, then doctors start to look at that because they said, oh, there's a standard of care. I need to know what it is. So those are all good things. And I think that will increase the awareness. Um, and I mean, on a much larger level than me giving a lecture. But they, they really, the position statement doesn't really educate them about the physiology like we talked about. Uh, so that's tough. I mean, it is, it is hard because there aren't that many centers that treat CF diabetes, and the ones that do, I don't think many of them have an endocrinologist. But yeah, I think we're moving in the right direction. Well, I think the first one was answered already. How to diagnose. Diabetes. Right. I mean, pretty much the same as any other kind of diabetes now. Any other questions? Yes. I guess there was recently a beta cell line that was finally more So what, what, what will that mean? Well, I don't know. I think we're, I think we're a long way from having, you know, some sort of a stem cell transplant. And even the um, islet transplant seems to have stagnated. Um, the best transplant option for diabetes right now is still a whole organ, pancreas transplant. Um, so, you know, there was this nice trajectory of improvement, and I, I feel like it might be leveling off. Um, I, I hope that one day we'll be able to transplant uh, stem cells or some, you know, islets. Uh, but at this point, we're far from being able to do that. And the patients with CF, I don't really think that their diabetes is severe enough to necessitate that because they can be easily managed with insulin. Um, the patients, you know, who make absolutely no insulin are much harder to manage. And, um, and, and usually they'll do a transplant in the setting of a kidney transplant as well, and, and it's really helpful for them. I don't think the CF patients um, would really need to do it. Okay, anybody else? Got one more that just came okay. from online. Where can we find the ADA 2010 position statement? Is there an easy way to access it on their website or some other place? Well, I haven't looked on the website, but I think if you Google, um, it, you could probably just Google it or you could look on the ADA website. You would, it would be the uh, 2010 position statement on cystic fibrosis-related diabetes. I mean, you'd have to say that. So, I mean, probably even Google, you could find that. Okay. Thank you. We've been uh, sharing this evening's discussion of cystic fibrosis-related diabetes with Dr. Tracy McLaughlin. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for joining us online and here today. Uh, we have evaluations to fill out appreciate if you do that. In addition, if you want to re-access this presentation, you can go to our website and you can let others know about what you've heard tonight. 
We will be, again, having a CF Discovery Series. It is the second Tuesday evening of each month for the remainder of the year. Many thanks again to AMED and to Genentech for supporting this effort uh, so that we can share this really critical information with you across the miles. Have a very good evening. Thank you.